You turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to take us uh, through a journey in Scripture tonight. I'm, I'm actually going to break some homiletical rules. When I was in preaching school, they said good preaching is a couple Scriptures and you exegete those. Nah. Let's, let's, uh, let's, I'm going to do something different. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Shane Willard. This is all I do for a living. I travel all over the world. And um, I've had the incredible privilege of being mentored by a pastor who happens to have his rabbi training. And um, so we, we have our table there at the back on your way out if you want to come say hello. Um, there's a lot of things that come from that side of things. I'm, I'm so, so privileged to have been mentored by the man and um, still, still am. Um, I uh, also have a master's degree in clinical psychology, so anything you'd want's back there. And uh, the profit margin from the table um, enables us to fulfill our mission in the world, which is to take care of the poor and the afflicted, and, um, and also to minister in places that can't afford it. So um, before you go out tonight and feed your, your stomach, all I'm asking you to do is come by, say hello. Let me put something in your hand that will change the way you look at God forever. And in so doing, you're going to put something in my hand that lets me feed people that can't eat. Um, pretty good idea. Um, also, um, if people ask me, well, what goes along with this? Um, our, our series um, this weekend and through the week is called Position to Win. You can get it on CD or DVD. We're just taking orders. There's a little card you fill out when they're done. Um, you can just pick them up right here or we can post them to you. Um, a good supplement to that is our series called Running from God. Um, it's a series on the book of Jonah and Yom Kippur, and it'll, it'll really supplement what we're doing well. So, But you could pick up anything you'd like back there, and uh, we'd love to see you back there. Also, you could pick up a flyer for our online mentoring. Um, once a month, I'm in an online classroom teaching people to see the Bible, just like my rabbi did me. So if, you, uh, if that interests you, you can uh, pick that up, and, and, and we'll go for it. Okay, Matthew... Uh, chapter 6. Let me just review a couple things from this morning. Um, number one, anytime you're reading any piece of, any piece of literature, any piece of literature, um, you want to ask yourself a couple questions. Number one, who wrote it? Uh, number two, who was it written to? Uh, number three, how would those people have taken it? It's very important never to separate yourself from how those people might have taken it. So, in, in the Bible, when you see life, light, or increase... This is not talking about heaven. This is talking about a realm of life now that leads to completion, favor, multiplied blessing. It's a life that is taking you to wholeness. Essentially, when you choose to live in God's ways, it does nothing but great things for your life. All right? The same is true with these three words, death, darkness, decrease. Death, darkness, and decrease. Once again, nothing to do with hell. All right? doesn't mean hell's not real. It just means those words have nothing to do with hell. All right? Hell is, is another entity in and of itself. Death, darkness, and decrease, when you see those words, it means when people choose to live outside of God's ways, it unravels their completion. It leads them to a life of disrepair. All right? So it, it, essentially, I feel like my life is coming apart at the seams. That is darkness. That is death. Darkness decrease. I'm working harder and accomplishing less. Th these sorts of things. So life, light, and increase. Death, darkness, decrease. And this morning we talked about um, that, that if, you to, if you want to position yourself to win, part of that is taking responsibility. Yes, we believe God. And yes, we want God to move. And yes, sometimes we need a touch from God. But, but oftentimes, a new heart and a new spirit is simply one decision away. And that decision is, I'm going to live God's ways. I, I am not going to tolerate death, darkness, and decrease in my life. I'm going to choose light, life, and increase. And Ezekiel's take on it was, when you choose those things, God doesn't heal your heart. He just simply gives you a new one. All right, and that's where we were this morning. So tonight I want to help you with your walk with God by sharing something that really helped me with my walk with God. Uh, essential to walking with God is this question. What must I do for him to hear me? What, what, what do I need to do for him to hear me? Um, what, what do I need to do to get him to move on my behalf? These are questions that have been around forever. Um, and this is, this is what I was taught. Um, when you pray... Um, first thing you have to do is confess all your sins. All right, so you've got to get that all out the way, and you have to say it out loud because God might not know, right? So you've got to be sure, you got to be sure to say it out loud, and you've got to rack your brain, and you've got to get them all out in the open because if you're, heart, if you're hiding something, God's not going to hear you. So, so you've got to get all that out in the open. So you've got to confess your sins. That's number one. That, number two, this is what I was taught. I'm, this is not the message tonight. I'm actually going to do something antithetical to this. Um, no, number two, I was taught, first you confess your sins. Second, you've got to praise. 
right? Because if you start your prayer before you praise, God's going to think you're selfish, as if he doesn't know your heart anyway, right? So, so you, so you got to get all your confession out, and then you get all your praise out, and, and then you can get into your praying bit, and, um, and this is how you walk with God. And that, that's just, look, very good-hearted people taught that because someone taught them that, and someone before that taught them that. But, but I think if we look back and look at how Jesus talked about how to relate with God, we're going to find something far different. And um, if you'll stick with me tonight for the next few minutes, if you'll just sort of put everything to the side, I, I promise you I'm going to share something with you that will set you free for as long as you can carry it. It is uh, something that has helped my life tremendously. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. Jesus is talking about how to pray and how, how to walk with God. And, and so he starts out by telling you what not to do. This is what it says. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like Pentecostals. <laughs> For they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need uh, before you ask. Now, a couple questions. Number, number one, um, he's talking to a bunch of Jews and he references pagans. D don't babble like pagans. And there's no clarifying statement at all. So I have a question. Who were the pagans that these people would have been thinking about? Uh, Jesus is referencing a group of people that he's assuming his audience knows what he's talking about. Do not go on babbling like pagans. So, so, so what are the options? Well, there was a couple. Um, one, there was a, the main god of the Egyptians at that time, which had started to spread to the southern part of Israel, was a god named Amun-Ra. Amun-Ra. You might have seen the movie, about, the, the movie about him called The Mummy. Remember, like, Amun-Ra was the guy that came back from the dead after like 4,000 years and really scared Brendan Fraser. All right, so Amun-Ra. He, he, he was an Egyptian god, and in their liturgy, in the, every, every religious group always has liturgy. Christianity has their liturgy. Liturgy just is a word that means this is how we do things here. Okay? This is how our worship services go. Okay? The, the liturgy of Amun-Ra said, you cannot start your prayer to Amun-Ra until you have listed all of his attributes. All right? So he had this list of attributes, and they would just begin to list them. Oh, great Amun-Ra, God of the sun, moon, and stars. Oh, great Amun-Ra, da-da-da-da-da. Oh, great Amun-Ra, da-da-da-da-da. Oh, great Amun-Ra. And they had this list of attributes that they had to go through before they got to their prayer. One of his attributes, by the way, was muscular legs. <laughs> oh, great Amun-Ra, God of muscular legs. Which leads to the question, how insecure is your God? I mean, can, can you imagine, like, you come to God, and God says, hey, listen, excuse me, before you start speaking, have you noticed the calves? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I have not missed a workout in a while. I need you to check it out. All right, so, so, so you have that um, option. Um, the other option, and the more likely option, is there was a very famous story in the Old Testament that they would have likely all memorized. And it's a story about Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Essentially, this is what happens. Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal that whoever God answers by fire, that's the real God. Now, quick history lesson. If you go, my friend, he's a pastor of a great church in Baltimore. His name's Terry Kirk. He told me this, that he actually saw this on an uh, Israel tour. So if you go to an Israel tour and you choose the right one, they'll actually show you this. They have a replica of the altar to Baal. And so essentially what it was, was there was an altar to Baal, and then on top of the altar was Baal, right? And here was the rule. You couldn't get too close to the altar of Baal because it was holy. And if you got too close, Baal would kill you. So essentially everybody was too scared to get too close. And what they did was, is they built the altar so high, and then underneath it they dug a passageway. So what would happen, the only one close enough to see down into the passageway was the priest and the prophets. Because if you got too close, Baal would kill you. So the priest of Baal would come out to make an announcement. Presumably, let's say, to raise money or whatever they were going to do. He would stand in front of the altar and no one could get close enough. And he would make a proclamation. And then after the proclamation, he would say, If this be true, let Baal answer us by fire. And what they would do is they took all their underlings and they marched them in the, into this secret passageway. And when he said that, all they did was hold fire up, right? <laughs> so, so to them, when he said, let Baal answer us by fire, there was a bunch of people bringing fire up from the ground, all right? So the altar of Baal appeared to be ablaze, but all it was was a bunch of Bible college students <laughs> underneath there holding up fire, right? 
so, so Elijah knows this, and Elijah says, he tricks him. He says, hey, guys, um, let's have a test, and whoever's test, whoever's God answers by fire is the real God. And, of course, the prophets of Baal are like, oh, we got this. Answer by fire. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We, yeah, we'll do that. And after they agreed, he said, oh, no, 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 no. I know you can bring up fire from the ground. That's child's play. Let's do it fire from the sky. Right? <laughs> So, so they say, they're, they're stuck now. What are they going to do? So to get Baal to bring fire from the sky was a bit harder than getting him to bring fire from the ground. So, so this is what it says. You can go back and read the story. It's in 1 Kings or 2 Kings, somewhere in there. It says, it says that the prophets of Baal, to get their God to answer them, this is what they did. They shouted their God's name from morning until midday. When that didn't work... They shouted his name even louder. When that didn't work, they began to sing and dance and turn in circles. When that didn't work, they began to shout his name even louder. And when that didn't work, they reverted back to cutting themselves. So here was a group of people to get God's attention that they shouted his name. They shouted his name even louder. They sang and danced and turned in circles. And then they shouted his name even louder. Does that sound like anybody you know? Um, maybe we're doing more babbling than we thought. Now, before you go somewhere I don't want you to go, um, it, I, I, God delights in the praises of his people. He wants you to shout to the Lord. This kind of thing. I'm not talking about method. I'm talking about motive. Wait a minute. <clears throat> Are you... Entering into worship in order to get God to do something for you, or are you entering into worship as a celebration of what's already been done? Those are two totally different things. That's, that is totally different. Are you entering into prayer to do enough to get God to, to act on your behalf? If I confess my sins enough, anybody here besides me ever told God you were sorry for the same sin more than once? Right? So if I do that enough, if I confess hard enough, if I break through, if I press in, who in the world knows what that means? If, <laughs> if, if, if I do these things, then God will act on my behalf. Essentially, Jesus is saying, you're wasting your time. The, the, the way to relate with God is not to try to get God to do something. It's to really believe that he's already done everything that needs to be done and all things are yours, and you simply step into a realization of what is already true. Does that make sense? It's not method. Shout his name. Fine. Turn in circles. Great. Fall on the ground. Fantastic. Um, uh, shout his name louder. Sing. Dance. Do all those things. But do all those things to enter into an awareness of what's already true, not to babble enough in order to get God to do something. Two totally different things. Let me say it this way. Are you a cooperator with God or are you a manipulator of him? Wait, wait, wait how much can we do to possibly manipulate God to do what we want? Jesus is changing history. See, see in these people's minds, you had to do certain things for God to hear you. Jesus simply says, um, uh, this babbling, these, one translation might say vain repetitions. Um, the, these, the, these vain repetitions that are essentially pagan, they've slipped into Christianity. And, and it's not the way. It, it, it's not. It, essentially, Jesus is saying, if you want to walk with God properly, you need to start where you're trying to finish. That, that, what's your goal? At the end of all this babbling, what's your goal? Your goal is to have a felt sense of the presence of God. Your goal is for God to move on your behalf. Your, your, God, your, your, your goal is for the presence of God to flood the situation. Jesus says, look, skip all the babbling. Start where you're trying to finish. Just simply step into an awareness of God. He essentially, he says, he says, when you're praying, don't make your prayers about words. And don't make your prayers about needs. For don't you know your Father knows what you need before you ask. Well, hold on. If you take all the words out your prayers, and you take all the needs out your prayers, uh, what do you have left? Uh, I didn't have much. Uh, um, 
J- Jesus would go pray for an hour and speak for 90 seconds. What was he doing? He was becoming aware. Next, the next line of that scripture says, But when you pray, say this, My Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Without going into it, that's not a real good translation. Um, th- this is the actual Hebrew version of Matthew. This is what it says. My Father, who's as close to me as the air that I'm breathing, I stop and become aware of you. I- in other words, uh, start where you're trying to finish. Aware of God. That you can simply, Jesus is changing religious history here. That you can simply, without babbling, without vain repetitions, you can simply step into an awareness of God any time you want. Um, interesting. Now, uh, let me see if I can connect some dots from some other writers. Um, that is, I, I promise you, if you'll stay with me, I'm going to connect these dots. And it's, this is awesome. John chapter 1, uh, verse 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. The question is, is how could Jesus say something like that? What, it, it sounds like Jesus is saying, you don't owe God anything. It sounds like Jesus is saying that God just wants to be with you, and you don't owe him anything. You can just kind of step in. Um, wh- what would allow him to say that? This is all New Testament writing, and I just want to try to connect these dots to you. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, this is a reference to what? Where's the beginning? Genesis. All right, so this is a reference to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1 1 starts out this way in the beginning. John 1 1 starts out in the beginning. John 1 is a commentary on Genesis 1. So to John, something's going on in Genesis 1 that's very important. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. It was the light that shines in the darkness. But the darkness could not understand it. So to John, something was going on in Genesis 1 that defined who God is as the Word. The Word. Now we're, we're going to come back to that in a second. But when did it happen? Genesis 1. Let, let's keep reading. There came a man from God whose, whose name was John. And he came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He only came as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Skipping to verse 14. And then this word became flesh. So hold on. So to John, the word that was in the beginning, Genesis 1, has now put flesh on. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, I'm going to come back and define this here in a second. Just keep that in your mind. So John, the writer John says, listen, if you really want to understand what you have in God, you have to go to Genesis 1. In the beginning, there was this thing. So so when you go to Genesis 1 and you're trying to find out what he's on about, um, it it has to reveal something. And we're we're going to get there in a second. So to John... Something that was true in Genesis 1 is drastically important to our life now. Now, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 and 6. This is written by a man named Paul, a completely different writer. And here's what he says. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 through 6. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. Well, hold on a second. So he chose us in him when? Before the creation of the world. It doesn't say he chose us in him when you chose to came to an altar and say a prayer. No. Wait a minute. To Paul, this truth of you belonging to God somehow was revealed before the creation of the world. Which leads to a question. Do we have any record of before the creation of the world? Yes. The creation of the world started in Genesis chapter 1 verse 4. So the first three verses of Genesis, Paul is seeing something in the first three verses of Genesis that that says you should know that before the creation of the world, you were chosen to belong to him. So John is saying there's something in the beginning that you need to go take a look at. Paul is saying there's something in the beginning that you need to go take a look at. Let's look at the next writer, Um, the writer of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 3. Now, no one knows who wrote Hebrews. 
And that's because they would have killed whoever wrote Hebrews. Okay? <laughs> um, they, they chose to stay anonymous. I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. It's going to be a couple slides down. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. It says this. Now we who have believed enter that rest. Just as God has said, so I declared an oath in my anger that they shall never enter my rest. And yet, his work has been finished since the creation of the world. So, so the writer of Hebrews says, people who don't believe don't enter rest. People who do believe end up entering rest. And yet, the work was finished since the creation. So the writer of Hebrews is like, wait a minute, if you go look back at the beginning, there was a completed work there. And the only thing that separates people who are resting in it and people who aren't is belief. So you need to go back and look at the creation of the world. Uh, let's look at another uh, piece. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14 to 18. This is what it says. Because by one sacrifice he was made perfect forever, those who are being made holy. In other words, there's a lot of people who aren't perfect yet, um, they're still in their process, but God sees you as perfect because Jesus made you perfect, even though you're just simply being made holy, you're not really that holy. Can I get an amen? Uh, the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them in their minds. That is a reference to Ezekiel, by the way. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sins. Um, this is why the writer of Hebrews would have been killed. Um, you, you don't have to sacrifice anymore. In, in an earlier chapter, this is what he says. This is crazy. Remember, who wrote it? Nobody knows. Who was it written to? A bunch of Jews. How would they have taken it? This is what he says. Didn't you know all along it was impossible for the blood of sacrifices to take away your sins? <laughs> well, hold on. If you're a Jewish theologian, how many verses in Leviticus do you have to say you need a sacrifice to take away your sins? Uh, a bunch. Enough. Enough to have pamphlets, websites, and fundamental truths. <laughs> right? I mean, enough. Everybody knows you need a sacrifice to take away your sin. Yet the writer of Hebrews says, oh, look, all along you never had to sacrifice. It never did anything for you. Do you see why they had have killed them? Let, let, me put it, um, let, let me put it in today's terms. That would be the same as if someone got up and started preaching this. Didn't you know all along... It was impossible to come to an altar and say a prayer and ask Jesus in your heart and it do you any good. How would that go? I would say there would be websites dedicated to that person. So I'm not saying that. But that would be the same. For the writer of Hebrews to say, didn't you know all along it was impossible for sacrifices to do anything for you? That's the same. I mean, there would have been a giant gasp. Who is this person? Let us slit their throat. That would have been the response. That would have been the response all along. Then he says, but God simply gave you sacrifices to do. In other words, he's saying, um, I know what you're thinking. We have our verses. We have our websites. We have our pamphlets. We have our fundamental truths. I know what you're thinking. You've worked all this theology out. God clearly told us in Leviticus to offer sacrifices. I know what you're thinking. Let me just tell you, God, God only gave you sacrifices to do because you thought you needed to. <laughs> then he says this. Watch, watch this. He, he, um, um, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. It says, um, Then Christ... Uh, would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once and for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. In other words, he, he, the writer of Hebrews is saying, hold on, um, you never had to sacrifice. God gave you sacrifice to do just because you thought you needed to. For don't you know that Jesus died from the creation of the world at something called the culmination of the ages how awesome is that he says he says no no genesis 1 you gotta go back genesis 1 um if you go back and look you're actually going to find your redemption there um all that sacrifice and stuff not necessary 
That's it. Here's Peter's take. Here's another writer. So you got John, you got Paul, you got whoever wrote Hebrews, and then you got this guy named Peter, and this was his take. First Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Talking about Jesus, he says, For he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last days for your sake. <laughs> in other words, everything you saw Jesus do was accomplished before the creation of the world, um, but in these last days, he came and showed you what he did before the creation of the world, just so you could see it. Um, you, you couldn't believe it without seeing it, so he showed you. Uh, so, so you got John saying, take a look at the beginning. You got Paul saying, take a look at the beginning. You got Peter saying, take a look at the beginning. You got whoever wrote Hebrews saying, take a look at the beginning. I think that covers all of the New Testament writers. Um, hey, Revelation chapter 13, except Luke, but, but here we go. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. So John, who wrote Revelation, he starts our discussion with John 1, and then he sort of ends our discussion with Revelation 13. This is what he says, verse 8. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain before the creation of the world. So that, again, in Revelation, he's saying the, the lamb was slain when? Be, before, when was Jesus actually crucified? To, to, to the New Testament writers, was Jesus actually crucified on Calvary? No. Was he? Yes. Yeah, there's, a, there's a part of truth that says, yes, there, Jesus was physically crucified on Calvary. But to the New Testament writers, to them, there's something deeper. They're like, yeah, what you saw on Calvary was only a manifestation of something that happened in Genesis 1. Yeah. Now, now to, to, to fully understand this, we have to understand the progress of Revelation. Let, let, me, let me see if I can run through this very quickly. Throughout the Bible, God continually got nearer and God continually got nicer. So throughout the Bible, God's getting nicer and God's getting closer. Uh, uh, let me give you the, ni the, the nearer part first. In Abraham's day, where did God live? In the sky. He lived in the sky. And this was the logic. If God lives in the sky then God is the most powerful thing in the sky, so the God must be the sun. So, so in Abraham's day, they were sun worshipers. Are, are they, is it because they were bad? No, they were guessing. God lives up. He's in the sky. The sun's the most powerful thing in the sky. So in Abraham's day, God lives in the sky. 430 years later, by Moses' day, where did God live? In a tabernacle. So, so in Abraham's day, God lived up in the sky. By Moses' day, God decided to live in a tent in the middle of camp. And they just carried him around with them. They'd mastered the art of like packing the tabernacle up, and then they moved. And... So, so in Abraham's day, God lived where? Up. By Moses' day, God lived where? In a tabernacle, in a tent in the middle of camp. By David and Solomon's day, where did God live? In a temple. They actually built him a permanent facility. <laughs> they quit carrying him around. And they built him a permanent facility. God needs somewhere nice to live, so they built it for him. So, so Abraham's day, where did God live? Up. By, by Moses' day, where did God live? In a tent in the middle of camp. By David's day, they built him a permanent facility. By Jesus' day, where did God live? It, it says that God put flesh on and came amongst us. So, so wait a minute. So in, in Abraham's day, God's in the sky. Don't know where he is. In, by Moses' day, oh no, we can tell you where he is. He's in there, but you can't go really close to it. By David's day, they built him a permanent facility, but you still couldn't go in there. By Jesus' day, there's a guy, Yahweh in the flesh, walking around with flesh on. He came and he's dwelling amongst us and he's talking to us and he's teaching us how to live. By Jesus' day, God is as close as I am to you. That is a far cry from up in the sky somewhere. And Jesus goes, and now where does God live? He lives in our breath. He's as close as the air that, that we're breathing. So, so uh, my take on it is God was likely there all along. They just didn't understand it. 
So there was a progress of revelation. Wait a minute. God was up in the sky, to God lived in a tent, to God lived in a temple, to God was walking around with flesh on, to, to God is now in each and every one of us. And one writer in the New Testament says it this way, for don't you know that you are the temple of the living God? So, so now instead of one temple, he has a bunch, and he's as close as your breath. Well, so through the Bible, God is constantly getting closer. And that's okay. It's scary at first until you realize, ah, oh, no one's dead yet. <laughs> so, so in one sense, God is getting closer. In another sense, God is getting nicer. Um, in Abraham's day, how did you please God? Two ways. One, you sacrificed. One, you sacrificed. And two, you self-mutilated. Here was the problem. In Abraham's day, if you were to say, how do I please God? I would say, sacrifice. Your question would be, how much do I need to sacrifice? Here was the answer. I don't know. <laughs> so, so what you would do is you would sacrifice limitlessly. Limitlessly. And to the point where most of them were sacrificing their firstborn children because that's the greatest thing they could do. So in Abraham's day, there was limitless sacrifice and limitless self-mutilation. They would cut their arms. They would cut their arms. If you ever see a movie about Abraham and he looks like me, lie. His arms would have been cut 90 years of you have to cut yourself. How much do you cut yourself? I don't know. Just keep cutting yourself. Hopefully one day you'll do enough for God to like you. Um, so in the 14 and 1500s, when the Catholic Church and the monks, a certain sect of them, went back to self-mutilation, it wasn't anything new. It was simply a reversion back to the ancient god and goddesses that Abraham understood. So God shows up, and he begins to be nicer. So in Abraham's day, you limitless sacrifice and self-mutilation. By Moses' day, Moses says, no. We got to put some boundaries around this because we're starving around here, man. We're killing all our animals. So here's what we're going to do. <laughs> Moses' day was one sacrifice per family per year. One sacrifice per family per year on Yom Kippur. And there was only one self-mutilation. Circumcision. Circumcision. So in Abraham's day, you had to mutilate unlimitless. In, in Abraham's day, you had to sacrifice limitless. Moses' day, Moses was, no, God's nicer than that. One sacrifice per family per year, and if you're going to mutilate yourself, do it with circumcision. Circumcision is grace. Here's why. You can only possibly circumcise yourself once. That's it. I mean, if you could circumcise yourself twice, you the man. I don't know. I... I, I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know what to say. Um, so, so essentially, Moses is like, okay, one sacrifice per family per year. And if you're going to mutilate yourself, we're going to limit that to one time two on the eighth day so no one can remember that mess. <laughs> um, so, so Abraham's day was limitless sacrifice and it, limitless self-mutilation. Moses' day was one sacrifice per family per year and, and mutilate yourself once on the eighth day. By Jesus' day, Jesus went from one sacrifice per family per year to one sacrifice for the whole world for all time. Right? So, so, so now you, you've got... Something incredibly nice. And, and that's why the, 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 you watch Jesus' life. People all the time wanted to kill him. They, they wanted to throw him off cliffs and things like this. At one time it says they were going to throw him off a cliff. And it says he just passed through them. I want to go back and see a video of that. That is so Obi-Wan Kenobi, isn't it? it uh, these aren't the droids you're looking for. Like, like, like uh, what? Uh, yeah, these, these aren't, no. Um, so... So one sacrifice per family per year. And if you look at Jesus' life, he was making God far nicer than Moses. Like, remember there's this one time? Um, Jesus was, uh, he has this encounter with this tax collector. And the tax collector gives half of what he has to the poor. And Jesus said, that's it, salvation's come to you. Um, what, what, what was the response of the people? No, you can't call him saved. Everyone knows he has to offer sacrifice and he has it. He says, ah, yeah, but did you see his heart change? That, that's awesome. 
Like, there, there's this one time, um, there's this guy, he was paralyzed, and, and they lower him in from the roof of the house. And it says, and Jesus saw the faith of his friends and proclaimed his sins forgiven. What? Jesus saw the faith of his friends and proclaimed his sins forgiven? I, I would say to you that almost no Christian would have accepted Jesus back then. <laughs> I, I would say most of us aren't okay with that now. It's possible to get your sins forgiven based on having the right friends. <laughs> so if your friends are believing for you, uh, uh, like, and, and that was the, re- don't, don't feel bad. That was the reaction of the crowd too. They're, they're, they're like, they're like, you can't call his sins forgiven. He has not offered a sacrifice. Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but he has the right friends. Um, I don't know what to say. <laughs> um, oh, but so you'll know that I have the authority to do this. Get up and walk. Uh, uh, and then no one said anything. Um, so, so Jesus starts wrecking their ideas about how mean and how nice God is. Um, he started calling people saved that there was no way they were saved. Like there, there's this one time he, he went to a prostitute's house, and um, and what's going on in a prostitute's house? Hey, yeah, prostitution. Like Jesus is like between customers, right? <laughs> Which wouldn't that be awkward? Like. The, to come out of the back room and you run into Jesus in the lobby. Like, it'd be weird, wouldn't it? Like, you know, coming out, and you're like, oh, geez, Jesus, hey, man. What, what's happening, Doug? Um, I, I was just here to use the toilet. Very clean facilities here. And, and the buffet is awesome. Um, what, what, what would you say? And, and so Jesus has this encounter uh, with, this, with this prostitute. And um, you, you don't know really what happens, but the prostitute uh, gets so moved with the compassion of God that she kneels down and she begins to wipe his feet with her hair. And Jesus says, that's it. Faith has forgiven all of your sins without a sacrifice. Without a sacrifice. There was no, he, she did not go to the temple and offer a sacrifice. Everybody knows that's how you get saved. There's only one way to get saved, and that is to go to the temple, offer a sacrifice, have a priest give that sacrifice on your behalf, and forgive your sins. That is the only way to get saved. Everyone knows that. It's in our pamphlets. It's in our websites. It's on our fundamental truths. Everyone knows that. And anyone who claims to be saved who didn't get saved that way, we're in and they're out. We're right and they're wrong. We're going to heaven. They're going to hell. That is it. Everyone knows that. <laughs> We would never be that way, would we? We would never tell people, you have to say our prayer at our altar in our way or we're in and you're out. We would never be guilty of that. <laughs> Jesus says, ah, she's washing my feet with her hair. That's so cool. <laughs> we're going to just forgive her sins. It says that there was a Pharisee there. What was he doing there? <laughs> He's like the... <laughs> Like, what? What is fancy seeing you here? Um, and it says that, that he thought in his heart, this cannot be the Messiah, for he is letting an unclean woman touch him. And it says, and Jesus heard his thoughts. Once again, Obi Wan, right? That's so Obi Wan. And Jesus heard his thoughts and said, I desire mercy more than sacrifice. So, so to Moses, okayness with God was around one sacrifice per family per year. To Jesus, okayness with God was around mercy that God's just giving anyway. God's getting nicer. He's like, if you need a sacrifice, one sacrifice for the whole world for all time, fine. Fine. Now, how, 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 do, you, how do they do this? Well, it seems... That all the writers of the, New, of the New Testament seem to be pointing people back to Genesis 1. Hey, the, oh, you want to know how? Oh, go back. He was slain when? Before the foundation of the world. Oh, oh, oh you want to know how Jesus is doing this now? Oh, it's because you want to know why you never needed to offer sacrifices? Oh, you want to know how Jesus can call someone saved who hasn't offered? Oh, you wanna, oh it, the answer is in Genesis 1. The, the answer is back then. So let me show you Genesis 1. Here we go. This is, this is the only record that I know of that is before the foundation of the world. Here we go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth became formless and void, and darkness was upon the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. 
And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So something's going on here that every writer in the New Testament is saying, if you go look there, you're going to see that Jesus was slain there. I I don't see it. Uh, now the earth became formless and empty and darkness was over the face of the deep. But what, what, where did they get that? And it's not like just one had this a random idea. Like it's all the way through the New Testament. No, before, oh, go, before the foundation of the world. You, you, go check that out. So what I did, because I realized the Bible's not written in English, is I went back and I looked at it in Hebrew and, and it tells the entire story. Uh, let, let me show it to you. This is Genesis 1, 1, 2, and 3 in Hebrew. So what we just read, that's it. I, I know that that looks weird, but that's this. I promise it'll all be known here in a second. Okay. Bereshi bara Elohim, Aleph Tav, Hashamayim, Ba'alef Tav, Heretz. That's Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let me walk you through the words very quickly. In beginning of, created God, heaven, earth. People ask me all the time, Shane, what's the best literal translation? Well, first, you don't want a literal translation. You wouldn't be able to read it. The job of a translator is not to be literal. The job of a translator is to make it readable. Okay? A literal translation of Genesis 1 would be, in beginning of, created God, heaven, earth. Now, this is written in a form of Hebrew literature called reverse concentric symmetry. Don't worry about the word. It just simply means that... They make a main point. So A plus B plus C equals D. And then that's how, in English, that's how we stop. A plus B plus C equals D. To them, they don't do that. They say A plus B plus C equals D equals C plus B plus A. All right? So they have to make parallel statements on the way out. So A is connected to A, B is connected to B, C is connected to C, and then D is the main point. All right? So, the main point of Genesis 1-1 is what? Aleph Tav. Aleph Tav. Now, they didn't know what to do with that. Because it means nothing. It's not in your English Bible. They wouldn't know how to translate it. It it just means nothing. It's just there. And, by the way, there's two of them. So, so the the, the problem was, is that that the main point of Genesis 1-1 is a word they couldn't translate. They didn't even know what it was. Don't quote me on the number here, but like 41 times in the Old Testament, the word Aleph Tav is used in connection with Elohim. And Moses saw the backside of Elohim Aleph Tav. And they're like, what is this? What is this Aleph Tav? They didn't know what to do until in the book of Revelation, Jesus hollers down from heaven, I am the Aleph and the Tav. It gets translated this way. I am the Alpha and the Omega. It, it, the first and the last. Aleph and Tav are the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So essentially Jesus is saying in Revelation, Hey, you've been wondering what the main point of Genesis 1 was? It's me. <laughs> um, that's me. I am the Aleph and the Tav. Um, I- interesting, by the way, um, you have an Aleph Tav here, which is a reference to Jesus the Messiah. You have an Aleph Tav here. The only difference between that one and that one is a Va. Now, very quickly. Every Hebrew letter is a picture. They came from Egypt. They wrote in hieroglyphics until Babylon. Every Hebrew letter is a picture. So every Hebrew word is a comic strip. The picture of Va is a nail. So if Aleph Tav is a reference to Jesus the Messiah, and there's two comings of him, and the second one he is nailed, all right? So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Main point being Jesus the Messiah. Now, next verse, this is what it says. And the earth became formless and void and dark. Does that sound good or bad? Bad. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Main point being Jesus the Messiah. And the earth became formless and void and dark. Well, that's bad. Let me walk you through the words. The the words are, Tohu va bohu va koshek. I like doing that. All right. <laughs> you ought to try it. Everybody try just the, the first two. Say, tohu va bohu. Try that. Ready? Go. 
Tohu va bohu. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's pretty cool. Tohu va bohu. Don't doesn't that, the tohu and bohu? Doesn't that sound like like a cartoon? The two stupid brothers guarding the mafia boss. Like who's that? That's tohu and bohu. Like it's just. Uh, uh, <laughs> tohu va bohu. Formless and void. Now let, let me let me go through this. The word tohu is translated formless. But if you go to Strong's Concordance and you look up the word tohu, it, the, the, the root word tohu means this, incapable of distinguishing reality from not reality. Wow. Incapable of distinguishing real from not real. Now think about that. Stay with me for a second. If I were to say someone over here can't tell what's real from what's not real, what are they? They're crazy. That's crazy. So, so essentially, it says, it says um, and the earth became crazy, incapable of distinguishing reality from not. The translators chose the word formless. That makes sense. In other words, there, there's nothing, it could be here, it could be there, it doesn't matter because they can't tell what's real and what's not. Now, th there's two pictures in Tohu. There's a cross, the T's a cross, and the H is an open window, means to reveal something. So a cross and to reveal something, and the va is a nail. The va is a nail. So you got a cross, a revelation of the cross, and a nail. All right? Next word, bohu. Tohu va bohu. <laughs> now, you don't have to be a Hebrew scholar to see that tohu and bohu are related words. They have the same root. The only difference is, is the B. The B is a house. It, 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 they translate it empty or void. Actually, the root is an uninhabitable house. So, so something, something that makes your house uninhabitable. So, so essentially, this is what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Main point being Jesus the Messiah. And the earth became crazy. And that craziness invaded your house. It, it, and made it uninhabitable. In other words, it's not a situation where, like, you're crazy and I'm not. No, no, no. It, craziness invaded the whole thing. It, and it made our house uninhabitable. Interesting on the pictures. You've got a cross, an open window, a nail, a house, and an open window. It, essentially, the, 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 the idea is, is your house did not have a revelation of the covenant of the nail. Wow. Uh, it didn't know. It didn't know. So, so it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth became crazy. And that craziness invaded your house and made it uninhabitable because you didn't have a revelation of the covenant of the nail. Next word, and darkness. Koshek. Darkness is a euphemism for anything that brings your life to disrepair. Anything that brings your life to disrepair. Interesting. The pictures, you got three letters, C-H, S-H, and K. A C-H is a hedge or a fence. An S-H are teeth. And a K is a hand over a head. So essentially darkness, which is anything that leads your life to disrepair, is this. The boundaries that you're choosing to live in is eating your covering. It's consuming your covering. In other words, the boundaries you're choosing to live in is consuming your covering. In other words, your authority has given you a certain way to live. You're choosing to live another way, and it's eating you alive. It's, it's eating you up. Um, so, so let's go back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Main point being Jesus the Messiah. And the earth was crazy. And that craziness invaded your house and made it uninhabitable. And it's because you didn't have a revelation of the covenant of the nail. And this led your life to a perpetual pattern of disrepair because the boundaries you were choosing to live in was consuming your covering. And this perpetual pattern of disrepair was presenting itself in the face... Pene, let's remember English. Here, let's go back to English. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. This perpetual pattern of disrepair was presenting itself in the face of the deep. The word deep is tehom. Tehom. If you break down the pictures on it, one of the root words of tehom is God's hidden blessings. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, this is what it says In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, main point being Jesus the Messiah. And the earth was crazy, and that craziness invaded your house and made it uninhabitable because you didn't have a revelation of the covenant of the nail. 
And this led your life to a perpetual pattern of disrepair. Because the, because the boundaries you were choosing to live in was consuming your covering. And this life of disrepair was presenting itself in the face of God's hidden blessings. In other words, God had this for you, but you were choosing to live outside of that. And your life of disrepair was presenting itself in the face of what God had. Uh, um, let's go back to English. And the earth became formless and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. So God's response to our life of disrepair presenting itself in the face of God's hidden blessings, God's response was to hover. Um, here's what it is in Hebrew. The Ruach, the Spirit of God, the breath, the Spirit, Rafesh, hovered, hovered. If you go look that word up in Strong's Concordance, this is what it means. To grow soft or to relax. So here, here's what's going on. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Main point being Jesus the Messiah. And the earth became crazy. And that craziness invaded your house and made it uninhabitable because you didn't have a revelation of the covenant of the nail. And this led your life to a perpetual pattern of disrepair because the boundaries you were choosing to live in was consuming your covering. And this life of disrepair was presenting itself in the face of God's hidden blessings. So God's response was to relax. <laughs> the Spirit of God relaxed. Look where? The Spirit of God relaxed in the face, face of the water. The word water is mayim. It means water or waste. In the pictures, it says this, open-handed violence. Open-handed violence. A slap in the face. Open-handed violence. So this is what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Main point being Jesus the Messiah. And the earth was crazy. And that craziness invaded your house and made it uninhabitable because you didn't have a revelation of the covenant of the nail. This led your life to a perpetual pattern of disrepair because the boundaries you were choosing to live in was consuming your covering. And this life of disrepair was presenting itself in the face of God's hidden blessings. But God's response was to relax to the slap in the face you gave him. <laughs> um, remember one time? Yahweh put flesh on, his name was Jesus, and he says if someone slaps you, he's just simply manifesting what was true in Genesis 1. Um, you slapped me in the face and I relaxed for you. Why, why wouldn't you relax for someone else? So God's response was to relax in the face of open-handed violence. He was to relax in the face of an open-handed slap. And God instituted a solution. It says this in English, and God said, let there be light. So God's solution to this whole thing was let there be light. In Hebrew, it says this, let the one who is light shine. Let the one who is light shine. It, it, essentially, he says, let there be aura, aura, light, aura. You have a nice aura, light. Let there be light. Well, hold on. Hold on. If you go back to the beginning and you put a revelation of the cross on Torah, what do you get? Torah. <laughs> the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. In Him was life. And that life was the light of men. It was that light that shone in the darkness, but the darkness could not understand it. So the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us so we could see it. In, a, in other words, um, everything Jesus did was simply a physical manifestation of what God did in Genesis 1. In other words, God was smart enough to outthink the rebellion of humankind. <laughs> wow, imagine that. <laughs> In other words, God was smart enough to take care of it before the world began. Um, you, you might say, what does that mean for me? Uh, a lot. <laughs> a whole lot. Here's the summary statement. In the beginning, God, Jesus the Messiah, created the heavens and the earth. And the earth became crazy and the craziness invaded your house. 
because you did not have a revelation of the covenant of the nail. This led your life to a perpetual pattern of disrepair because the boundaries you chose were consuming your covering. This life of disrepair was presenting itself in the face of God's hidden blessings. So God responded to this slap in the face by relaxing and declaring a solution full of grace and truth. A word that was both with him and was him. Let the one who is light shine. Um, so what does this mean for you? It means a lot. Uh, 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 number one, it, it means you could quit babbling. <laughs> um, you, you don't owe God anything. Every, everything he did was, was taken care of before the world began. Why? Because God is smart. You don't owe God anything. God doesn't want you to owe any, him anything. God simply just wants to be with you. You can start where you're trying to finish. You don't owe God anything. Do you see now why the writer of Hebrews is like, don't you see you never had to sacrifice? Why? It was, it was already done. To, to John, the word, let there be light, became flesh. That this, to John, and to the writer of Hebrews, and to Peter, and to Paul, this was actually a person. Why? Because in Hebrew it says, let the one who is light shine. It, it, it's, it's obvious to them. Oh, yeah, oh, no, this, God, you mean we never had to sacrifice? We never had to babble? We never had to do vain repetitions? We can simply be aware of God all the time, all day, every day. We can actually pray without ceasing because prayer is simply an awareness of the mighty one being in us. Yes. That's huge ramifications for us. You don't owe God anything. It, it's in our language. It, essentially, what, what the second thing it means for us is you don't need to babble. First thing, first thing is what you don't need to babble. Second thing is, is, is that, that we need to, to practice stepping into what's already true. It, it's in our language. Here, here's, here's one. Here's one. Worship starts at 7. Really? No. Worship started here. And at seven, your group of people are simply entering into something that's already been going on forever. Yes. It's totally different. Yes. It takes the pressure off of us. We, we don't have to make anything happen. It's already happening. You're just walking into it. Oh, how about this one? I got saved August 17, 2009. Really? I would say your redemption was bought and paid for here. And on August 17, 2009, you walked into an awareness of the truth of that and chose to receive it. That's it. Hey, all, all the writings in the Bible always talks about this kind of stuff in past tense. By his stripes, you am healed? No, you were healed. Wait, wait where? Here. When was he striped? Here. When was he crucified? Here. Right? No, no, you don't need to press in for healing. You need to somehow access what's been true since the foundation of the world. And it doesn't require babbling because it's already true. That, that no amount of babbling is going to make it more true. No amount of confession is going to make you more holy. No amount of prayer is going to make you... No, no, no. Prayer, worship, all of this is simply accessing... What does it say? You are now seated with God. Where? In heavenly place. Really? It looks to me like you're here. No. To, to, to them. To them. No, no. Don't you... It's always reminding you. Of, you, you don't have to make something true. It all ready is because of a declaration of a solution given by God to what? A slap in the face. This was not God's response to the sinner's prayer. This was God's response to a slap in the face. And he said, still, let the one who is light shine. <laughs> this was true before anything else. The question is, if you want to position yourself to win... Can you have the faith it takes to actually believe that you can walk with God without babbling? <laughs> That's faith. To actually walk with God without babbling. To access what's been true all along. I bless you tonight to know that you serve a God who believes in you more than you believe in Him. I bless you tonight to know that God has been okay with you since before you were born. <laughs> um, the only difference is, is whether or not you've chosen to receive what's already true or not. Yeah. Um, I bless you tonight to know 
that everything you have is already in God. Everything you need has already been done. The issue is not getting God to do it. The issue is stepping into what's already true. I bless you tonight to know that you serve a God who doesn't require you to babble, cut yourself, endless sacrifices. Everything's already been done. You can simply walk in the garden and have fellowship with our God. Why? Because to position ourselves to win requires us to be God aware. And the only way we can be God aware is have the faith to believe that we don't owe him. That's not a relationship. A relationship is not a relationship when you owe somebody. That's a slave. A relationship is when we can just simply step into the one. And when you pray, say this, my father, who's as close to me as the air that I'm breathing, I stop and become aware of you. I bless you to be a people who can do that and take that to the world. Let's pray together. Lord, you're awesome. And um, I'm very humbled by what you did before the world began. Thank you so much for responding kindly to the slap in the face. I really appreciate it. Lord, I receive what you've already done and choose to walk in it. Maybe there's someone here tonight who would say, Shane, um, I, I, I don't think I've ever received what's already been true of me. And I'm surely not walking in it. And tonight, I'd like to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ. I realize what he's done for me and I want to receive what's already been done. Um, if that's you, I would encourage you right now to respond to God in your heart. Just say something like to him, just something like, I don't know, just, Lord, I, I, I choose to receive what you did. It could be something that simple. It could be something like, please remember me. It could be something like, Lord, I'm a sinner, have no hope of saving myself. I need you to save me. Whatever, whatever it is for you, I want you to just respond to God in your heart. And maybe you're here and you've been walking with God for a while, but your whole walk with God is consumed with babbling. And I want you, um, I want you to receive this right here. Lord, let the presence of God settle over this place so mightily that we know we can access it without earning anything. I bless you with an awareness that you can walk with God without feeling like you owe him. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance to you and give you peace. And let the name of God go with you always. Thanks so much for letting me be your guest this weekend. I'd encourage you, if you can, to come back Tuesday night. We're going to continue the series. It'll just get better and better. And Wednesday morning, if you can. God bless you real good. I'll turn the service now back over to Pastor Clark.